don't forgive me for this trap shit. Sergeant Smack making backflip. Telly Hank it with the action. With the Vato speaking Spanish. Frank Matthews, how I vanish. Poof. Came back like I'm King Tut. Go BBS is on a beamer. When Fat Cat was tearing queens up. Fall off the prop and not the re up. Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus. Uptown like I'm Baby May. Just caught a touchdown. Do you feel for those mothers who lost their children and babies to senseless gain and youth violence? Do you have a message of consolation for those mothers? Yeah, I, I do. Um, like with Yummy, when he passed on, you know, I know that hurt his family. I know it hurt the family of the female he supposedly have, you know, shot. Um, just recently, this lady wrote me named Clovis Benjamin from San Francisco, and um, she's a male woman. And she was writing me, telling me about her son, her nephew, had just been killed. And the day before he went to go, the day before he died, he was like, I'm going to get two parts of the tape. It was an unusually chilly September night in 1994, as the body of an 11 year old was loaded into the back of an ambulance. He had been shot twice in the back of the head in a hit ordered by the leaders of the Black Disciples. Craig was only 16 years old when his mugshot was plastered on TV, arrested for the murder of 11-year-old Robert Yummy Sandifer. His brother Derek, 14 at the time, was too young for his mugshot to be released. He was convicted of driving the Gataway car. All three, Craig, Derek, and Yummy, members of the same gang, chasing money, respect, and trying to make a name for themselves. In Chicago, well on its way to recording 930 homicides, the second highest on record. Among the dead, 14-year-old Siobhan Dean, shot in the head by a stray bullet during a shooting spree in the city's Roseland neighborhood that injured two other teens. Chicago police quickly identified 11-year-old Robert Sanderfer as the gunman. That led to an intense three-day manhunt. Gang leaders decided that Robert needed to be silenced because he knew too much, so they ordered Craig to kill him. Hours after the murder, both brothers were in custody, and months later, they were convicted felons. Craig, 60 years for murder, Derek, 45 for driving the Gataway car. All of you children that are standing here, looking down, take a good look, and I want you to say, within your heart that you will never end up like Robert. Okay? Cry if you will. <laughs> Make up your mind that you will never let your life end in tragedy like this. <laughs> Okay. okay, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Yo, yo, we back. It's your boy, Papala. Mob ties we on our way to illinois with it the good old city of shy town shy rack all my people from chicago y'all get in the comment box y'all know this like second home to us now in this story that we're going to be detailing today is probably going to be one of the most heart-wrenching and definitely probably the saddest and one that I could really say hit me and is one of the inspirations behind me starting this channel because I do remember firsthand seeing the widespread media coverage involving this incident. And the person that we talking about today is going to be Robert Yummy Sandifer. Now, a lot of people today would not know how important Robert Yummy Sandifer was or is but at the time of his murder 
he became almost like a symbol of the gang problem in America's inner cities. And on top of that, the failure of social safety nets and the shortcomings of the juvenile justice system. As crazy as that sound, today it's a little common for a young person to get killed. But back in that time, 11 year olds were not getting executed. It was definitely uh, no women, no old people, no children type situation going on. Now, by all accounts, Robert Sandifer was born in Chicago, Illinois on March 12th, 1983. And he was pretty much brought up in a tumultuous home. Uh, his mother, Lorena Sandifer, she had numerous arrests. I read where it was upwards of 30 during her career of prostitution, as well as a couple drug-related run-ins. So by all accounts, she was far from a fit or a present mom at that, but it was said that she was really, really strict and definitely on yummy because they're going to say as young as three years old, he was already known to the Department of Children and Family Services. And some people even said that he was alleged to have cigarette burns on his arm and on his back and bruising that was consistent with physical beatings like from a belt. Now, his mom would initially blame his father, but some of that was recanted. And as far as his father is concerned, he was a gentleman by the name of Robert Atkins. And he was pretty much an absent father. And a lot of that was due to him serving time in the state penitentiary for felony gun possession. So with all the issues his mother was dealing with and the chaos going on at their home in 1986 at the age of three, Yummy and his siblings were removed from his mother's house by the Department of Children and Family Services, and they were sent to live at their grandmother's house in the Roseland section of Chicago. Now, they're gonna say at the time, his grandmother's residence contained as many as 19 children on some occasions there. So by some accounts, they're gonna say that his grandmother's house was no better than his mother's house. But I also read reports that disputed that, that said his grandmother showed him love and was there for him. But when you're dealing with a household that has 19 children in it, it's pretty much a delegate your love kind of situation because it's hard to focus on that one child. Now, without a father figure in his life and that lack of attention that he probably really needed, definitely at that point, they're going to say at the age of eight, he would quit attending school and he would begin to roam the streets doing things like stealing cars, doing burglaries, breaking into homes. Now, on the path that he was headed, it wouldn't be long in the year of 1993 at the tender age of 10, where he would have his first run in with law enforcement, where he was arrested and charged with armed robbery. And by all accounts, it was the time that he stopped going to school at the age of eight from his first arrest at the age of 10, where he would begin to hang with one of the dominant gangs in the city of Chicago, that gang being the Black Disciples. Now, it would be after his arrest, like all kids that you would think that would have committed such a serious crime at a young age, he was said to have seen a psychologist and the psychologist would go on to say that Robert was a child growing up without any encouragement or support. And he had a sense of failure that has infiltrated almost every aspect of his inner self. And just that in itself is a direct reflection of his childhood and how he was raised and just the emptiness that he was feeling. Now, it would be that same year of 1993 where Yummy and his siblings were removed from his grandmother's house and were sent to live at Lawrence Hall or the Department of Children and Family Services shelter that was located on the north side of the city. And it would be from that exact facility 
where Yummy Sandifer would end up escaping sometime in 1993. Now, it's widely documented that from 1993 until the time of his death, his whereabouts or living arrangements remain unclear, although he continued to be arrested by authorities. So let me put that into perspective for you guys. So let's just say like he escaped from the facility in December of 1993. That still leaves a eight month period where nobody knows where this 11 year old child is living, how they're eating or what they're doing every day. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, just imagine if it was January of 1993. That means that he was out in the world for an entire 20 months without anybody having any knowledge of his whereabouts. The exact time that he went missing from the shelter is unknown. So they wasn't looking for him before August 28th, 1994. But after that date, he was on the radar because it was then where he was ordered to do a favor for the Black Disciples gang. He would go on to take that order and open fire several times with a 9mm semi-automatic pistol, striking several youth in the crowd. Yummy quickly fled the scene. Among the victims of his many gunshots was going to be a 14-year-old girl by the name of Siobhan Dean, who happened to be hit by a stray bullet and ended up dying from her wound. Now, it's documented that at that time that a lot of people think that he was going through reflections and he wanted to be with family. And it's said on the 31st of August, the day before his tragic death, that he was saw standing on a neighbor's porch after asking the specific neighbor, could he call his grandmother, who he had a special relationship with, even though they had so many kids at that house. But instead of getting in contact with his grandmother, he would happen to run into two brothers, one 16 and one 14, Craig and Derek Hardaway. Now, the Hardaway brothers were also members of the Black Disciple Street Gang, and they would go on to rock Yummy to sleep, explaining to him that they were sent to take him to a safe location, and they were seen ushering him to a nearby vehicle. Now, Yummy being young and probably naive and probably looking up to these older gang members would follow them, but instead of taking him to a safe location, they would take him to a railroad underpass that was located at East 108th Street and South Dolphin Avenue, and they would order him to get on his knees. Now, while kneeing, Sandifer was shot twice in the back of the head by the Hardaway brothers, and his body was discovered by the Chicago Police Department early the next morning. Now, at this time, Chicago was a very dangerous place. It was upwards of 900 homicides at this time. But even with that many homicides, uh, 11 year old killed on train tracks, execution style, stood out with even that many murders. And it wouldn't be long before the authorities would catch up with the Hardaway brothers and they were sentenced to football numbers. Now, after Yummy's death, the details of his short but violent and crazy life was published all through the American media, almost culminating with him being on the cover of the Time magazine the same month in September of 1994, the same month that he died. So that should probably put it into perspective a little bit for y'all guys. But yeah, this is definitely a story that I felt like I need to cover that needed to be on the channel. Definitely a cautionary tale, definitely a sad tale. We wanna say RIP to Yummy, all the young soldiers. Y'all already know what it is with me. Y'all make sure y'all follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. Y'all make sure y'all hit the bell below so y'all know when this real trill spill shit is dropping. Y'all comment below, let me know who we need to cover, what we got wrong, who we missed, what cities we need to go to, all of that. And y'all get at me however y'all see fit. It's your boy Pablo. It's the mob. Mob, mob, 
mob ties.